So yeah, hello everyone. My name's Dan. Um, so this talk's going to be about bringing mobile games onto console. There'll be some design and technical info. I'll keep it light on technical, but um, it's also going to be about why it is and it isn't a good idea, when it is and isn't a good idea. And we're going to take a look at the problems that uh, we might be solving when thinking about something like this. So a very quick overview. Uh, I want to talk to you about bringing mobile games onto other platforms. Uh, but I, f I also want to talk about some very old, very well discussed problems. These are reaching audiences, it's discoverability, it's breaking onto the stores, cost efficient marketing, building products. These are all problems that have been discussed for several years now and they're still here. Um, we've got UA costs uh, have been an accepted part of our industry for many, many years. The ecosystem has changed hugely. Small developers can't compete in the same space as, as, as larger business, as the, the core and the meat of the business that's going on in the mobile space. And I'll cover our strategy, which is part of it, is targeting multiple platforms, multiple audiences. I'll go into some design and technical details. Uh, specifically, I'll use our, our last game as an example, um, talking about some of the details of getting a game onto PlayStation 4, Xbox One. The difference between the platforms from a design point of view and some things to think about if you are thinking about console. Uh, so yeah, briefly, uh, I'm Dan. Um, I used to be an architect, I now make games. Uh, I've worked at uh, uh, mediums, large studios, and now um, we have a small team. There's seven or eight of us. We're based in Leamington Spa in the UK. We have three games out. Uh, we've actually deployed to 13 different platforms uh, over our games. Uh, these are some of our games. If you know these games, then I guess you know who we are. Um, the top three are games that we've released, and and the bottom row are games that we're, we're currently working on, hopefully coming out this year. So we're a small developer. Um, we spend a lot of care thinking about how we're going to strategize our growth of our products. And we try and do this as early as we can. Um, I don't need to tell anyone here how many new apps are released every day on the mobile stores, how crowded the stores are, how difficult and high risk it is to depend on first party marketing for your game if you have a small or no user acquisition budget. How expensive it is to bid against the core of the market, the core of the business, which is the top 100 apps, uh, top 100 grossing. Consumers are swamped by a huge rate of releases. It's created a fallacy of choice. I think a lot of us will have also perhaps learned the hard way, maybe early in our careers, making a great game isn't enough anymore. There's a huge amount more to building a game, building a successful game. And this has been true for many, many years now. Consumers are not necessarily paying for great apps. The ecosystem's changed. Uh, they're more likely paying for perhaps worse apps that are in front of them because they're very effective at extracting money. And when you put it like that, it's kind of depressing. And I'm actually a huge fan of free-to-play, of the mobile stores, uh, of premium, premium mobile as well. And I think there are a lot of great businesses to be built by clients at the top of the charts with great ARPUs um, or just a brilliant product. But it's key that this is a very challenging business model. And when you're a small, medium developer, it's a very, very difficult space to break into. So I think there are other ways. There are lots of other approaches to grow products. And actually talking to people today and, and seeing other talks, a lot of people are engaging with this. And it's, it's a key part of, of any product design. There are lots of other approaches. Um, but I think it's the approach that's important. So it's being part of a product concept. It's the growth strategy being in the elevator pitch. It needs to be right up there 
as part of the idea. It needs to be a, a key and early part of the game design because as developers, uh, it's not like it was five, ten years ago when you just had to make the game and it was someone else's job to reach the audience and there was very much little competition. So we need to be dealing with these problems very early on as well. Um, and I don't think a growth strategy even needs to be that astounding or, or grand or, or have some, some, some root genius idea. I think a even basic or obvious growth strategy can be made great with hard work, iteration and polish, the same way that any game design can be made great. It's about the execution and the iteration and working at it. Uh, so for our example, I'm going to use Calvino Noir. It's our last game that we released. It's a film noir stealth game. It's a side-scrolling stealth game, uh, about 12,000 lines of voice narrative. It's set in the 1940s. It's rendered in black and white with really rich lighting effects. It's about story and atmosphere as much as it is about the stealth gameplay. It's on Steam, iOS, Apple TV, PlayStation 4. It's a premium game. It's very traditional in format. It forgets a lot of the lessons we've learned over the last few years. Um, and it's, it's kind of surprisingly old school, particularly in mobile format. So our high-level strategy with Calvin Noir was to target a niche audience. And actually, a lot of our, our strategies are not going to be impressive at all. Um, it's not really that clever. Um, there's a lot of kind of like basic common sense pieces. Um, so we're targeting a niche audience. It's we're going to try and service that audience with an experience that they want and they're not getting elsewhere. Uh, we're making games that are kind of difficult to make. They're difficult to clone. We're, we're quite lucky we've got a, a quite strong technical team uh, and they're able to, to build these hard to build products. Um, and so I guess we're to that to that end, we're playing to our strength there, but also being difficult to make also kind of potentially puts us in a space where there's less competition, there's less other games there um, that have the same nature to them. Um, which means we are in a less competitive space. Um, but even then, with, with these strategies I just laid out, only basic stuff, it's still going to be difficult for us because going onto mobile, little to no user acquisition budget, the game's a single player offline game, it's premium. We're very much relying on first party support because that's by far the highest conversion rate on mobile. It's going to get pirated, particularly on Android, a single player offline game. So part of our plan became to spread that risk by targeting additional platforms, aiming at similar audiences, looking for similar niches across various platforms, and targeting them in similar ways. So a quick review of our strategy. As I said before, there's, there's no genius in it. It's a series of basic common sense ideas. Um, and I think it's that uh, we've got the, we're targeting a niche, uh, we're focused on service in that niche. It's a good idea. It's very basic. I think you've heard that before. Um, we're playing to our strengths. Again, a good idea. We're focused on less competitive markets. Less competition, obvious. Hopefully, we're going to find it easier to, to reach an audience. Um, but as I said, I don't think it's as important having uh, a good strategy, having a, a very, very good strategy, as it is of just constantly engaging with this stuff from an early stage in the concept and putting the time aside to work at it and keep iterating it, stay with the plan and develop it. Um, so fitting the same game on mobile and console formats is kind of awkward. It's very awkward. Games that do it are often console first, and they're adapted to mobile. Um, and often they feel like a port. Even when the mobile version is done well, you can appreciate how the developers have adapted the experience to fit the platform. The game doesn't feel native. 
feeling native on both platforms, I think, is an unrealistic um, expectation uh, for any developer because the formats are so different, the audiences are so different. Uh, even when the, the mobile version is done well, you can appreciate how the developers have adapted the experience to fit the platform. The game doesn't feel native. The feeling of, of native, I'm talking about the game feeling specific for your device. It um, feels like it's tailored to you, it feels tailored to me. It makes the value uh, of the experience higher. It makes the value of your mobile hardware higher or your console hardware. Um, which is a shame because we can't really do entirely native for both platforms with our example, certainly. Uh, maybe we can with the right game design, the right type of game. But ultimately, the consumers are different. Their expectations are wildly different. And it's depending on if they just pull their phone out of their pocket to try and forget they're on public transport or whether they've just got home from work, they're collapsing on their sofa, and they're going to shout profanities over some Call of Duty. There's stereotypical experiences. They're not the same. But by understanding these kind of stereotypes, we can appreciate the audiences are very, very different. Uh, but some games can fit. Where there's some common overlap between what types of games go onto the platform. And this is an early part of, of our concept was to um, I guess we were going uh, with a very kind of old school traditional format to a game that was less native on mobile, but more comfortable going across different platforms, reaching different audiences. So it's worth pointing out that this particular strategy isn't going to work for all mobile games. Uh, it seems kind of obvious, but you need to have some level of familiarity with console games. Can I quickly have a show of hands? Who's worked on a console game before? Fantastic, one person. I'm, I'm almost the, the expert in the room. And is anyone working on a game at the moment that they think could potentially go onto console? Cool, awesome, okay, okay. So, um, I mean, there are obvious uh, types of games that are gonna fit on console, I think. Having familiarity with console, it's a really obvious point to make, but I think it is important. If you haven't played console games, you can't really make console games. You need to be a console game player. You need to have console. You need to understand that audience. Um, because the, the audience is so different. And going from a, a mobile ecosystem, um, it can be you know, a really big shock when uh, the, the dynamic shape of the, the audience is so different. What they're interested in is different. Their expectations are completely different. Uh, with console, I think the user expectations are obviously a lot higher. There's a huge tradition in the industry um, of how many decades of console development. There's a lot of AAA games on console. It's only been the last few years that you've started to see smaller games turn up. The digital-only stores have turned up over the last few years. And these have been hugely successful. We've seen a lot of games sell a lot of copies at lower prices on the digital stores, but prices remain high on console. So we have a game that can work. It's an unusual game, type of game for iOS, um, but it works. We're pleased with the iOS version. It's easy to imagine the console user base enjoying it too. So we just have to make the console edition. So I'll just kind of briefly cover the, I guess the tech slight technical side of it. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail here. I think if you are interested in doing this, have a chat with me after, and I can try and share the, the experience I've got, or send me an email. Um, but essentially, the kind of the critical differences is that um, it's, it's a low volume uh, system. There's not the same evolution that we've seen on mobile games, where these stores have set themselves up for a huge volume of new titles coming in. They're not dealing with thousands of games every day. They're not dealing with thousands of apps every day. They're dealing with a, a handful of apps. And the people running these stores can actually keep track of all of the games going through the, through the system. Um, and so it's very much a manned process. It's a difficult process. It's relentless. It's very, very much more difficult to what you might be used to uh, on a mobile platform. Uh, for 
if you're used to the mobile ecosystem, the submission process, particularly in the publishing process, does take a very, very, very long time. The key difference is the one of the titles. Um, the store team are keeping track, and it's not just the store team. There's the various technical teams that are managing the app signing and the provisioning and things like that that we're completely used to being just done completely automatically in seconds on mobile, can take weeks. So you're talking about allowing six months just to get through the process on a simple game. It's obviously going to be longer if there's more programming and more uh, technical side of things to do in terms of the port. Getting set up as developer and publisher is also a big deal. You've got to know someone. Uh, you've got to get access to someone who is working at the platform holder. You need an account manager. You need development hardware. It's obviously not the same as the consumer hardware. Uh, you've got to get that, obviously, from first party, which can be very expensive. Sometimes you can get some for free, but then you're talking about losing a lot of time in the pitching process and so on. Uh, you may also be able to get some through a publisher, which is a very good idea uh, if it's your, your first time on console. I'm too honest, still kind of overwhelmed with, with the, whole, the whole process. Um, so you have to write the code. Sometimes the APIs, they're obviously closed APIs. They're not open. Uh, so you're going onto a logged on site and stuff. There's less uh, feedback and review. Um, but on the other side of it, there is technical people at these first parties that are answering support tickets because they can handle the volume of support, um, which is absolutely fantastic when you do get stuck. But obviously, you can't open a support ticket every time you get stuck because it would take too long, so you will find yourself deep in the forums, deep in the documentation. I think not too much more than you would expect a normal game port. So if you've done any, any porting work before, I think you know what to expect. So the technical compliance is also an area to highlight. If you have worked at a console studio before, the technical compliance is pretty heavy. You're talking 20, 30 pages of A4, a very technical language of exactly how the game has to behave in certain conditions. Also, you're developing for not just one version of the game, but often you've got to submit the game several times to the, the various regions. For example, Sony America isn't the same as Sony Europe, Sony Japan, and there's separate submission processes for all of them. So you've kind of got to go through the same process several times. It's a very long process. So I will cut it there, other than to say it's a lot of work. It's a lot harder than mobile. but. The effort can be worth it. It's a much, much smaller ecosystem. I will go on to the, the, the benefits of uh, that later. So the nature of the consumers are very, very different. Mobile users are more used to an abundance of software, low cost and free, variable quality. Console players are better established, and they associate their platform with a small volume of AAA blockbuster games, which are highly priced. You've got the digital stores I mentioned before. Prices are still high. Um, a couple of publishers have told me they're seeing a lot of units sell around the, the $10 mark on, on the digital sales. Um, that's a very, very good price point, which is significantly higher um, than uh, you would see uh, on mobile on an equivalently marketed game. Um, so the user base is smaller, but the prices are higher. The expectations are also much higher. Console has established an nostalgic status as the original gaming platform, and the users are particularly protective. And so I guess it's important to take that into consideration when, when servicing that user base. So from a design point of view, the most obvious point to highlight is probably the control schemes. Um, I think this is the easiest way to discuss the differences in how you might go, uh, you might start around designing the, the two different editions. They're very, very different. You've got a touchscreen format. It's obviously not a control pad. It's not really used in the, the same format. Um, session games, where you're talking about two, three minute session, isn't really going to work in the same way. Uh, so it's only kind of uh, certain experiences that are going to transfer across well depending on your imagination. Um, 
getting a single game to feel as if it's specific to both platforms is very important. It needs to feel like the developer's gone to a, a, a deal of, of effort to make sure that the game is specific to that user, specific to the platform. And finding common ground between editions and implementing a game that works the same across the platforms. Um, for example, using a virtual joypad, for example, which we see on some mobile games. Uh, it's probably a bad idea. The consumer expectations are difficult to meet uh, where they're getting a hybrid experience. The console pads have a lot of buttons. You can only really fit a couple of, of actions on iOS. And our approach for Calvino Noir specifically ended up being a, a tap to move to, to target with UI buttons on the screen. Uh, so you'd move around the, uh, the scene using pathfinding on, uh, on mobile. Whereas with Joypad, it's the direct control, it's direct movement. So in terms of business considerations, um, if you have a premium game and you think it can fit on console, then awesome. Be mindful, the pricing disparity is a very, very important thing to think of um, at this end of the development cycle because, um, well, for example, Calvino Noir launched synchronously on PlayStation 4, Steam, iOS, and there was a big pricing disparity and it was a big mistake. Um, even though we sold very, very well on iOS, the, the other platforms, the users responded very badly because their edition was at least twice as expensive as the mobile edition and they couldn't understand the pricing disparity. Whereas from a developer point of view, a publisher point of view, the disparity is obvious. It's because the pricing scales are, are set on the platform and the game is going to sell at one price on one platform, another price on another platform. But the bridge is a big problem, and it's a big image problem. Um, and it can be a, a difficult kind of marketing issue to, to handle. Um, generally, the publishers I've spoken to over the last few years have said, lead on the higher price platforms, delay a mobile release until after a full price sales are made at the highest price points. So go to Steam and, uh, and console first. I think it's for everyone to understand their own game and understand their own title, but that does seem to be the, convert, the convention. I've had another publisher tell me, actually go to Steam first, iron out all the bugs, and not to say you're not going to QA the game, but really get that deep clean in with the, the Steam users where you're releasing a QA game, you're working out all of the gameplay issues that are deeply hidden within the game before you go on console. And that's because patching on console does cost money, it costs a lot of money. It's really difficult to do. You have to go through the same submission process. It takes months to build a patch. So um, that can also work very well. Marketing on Steam and console is a completely different game. On premium with mobile, I find that you're very, very limited to the, the tools you've got. Getting people onto the store is difficult. The press are much narrower. You're limited to a, a small number of of major um, press sites. Uh, with mobile, uh, with uh, console and Steam, it's a lot broader. It's a hell of a lot broader. You've got YouTube is a hell of a lot more uh, effective as is Twitch in terms of converting users. Uh, you've got much, much more established and larger uh, press base. And then there's also the status of having a console game, um, which to a lot of people uh, does make it seem like it's a, a more uh, major title, it's less indie, which um, I guess can be a, a, a stamp of quality for some people. Um, and this stuff can drive sales and build the profile of your game compared to mobile where consumers um, use the press less. There are fewer influential fewer news sites and it's just generally difficult to, more difficult to push users to the mobile sites and you're more dependent on first party. Um, so yeah, sorry, just did this slide. Uh, yeah, so I mean, that really covers the, the bulk of my talk. Um, on top of these conclusions of the design aspect of understanding your target audience, strategize your game's growth, do it early, do it at the start, get it in the concept, understand what your growth strategy is, work on it and develop it as much as you can. And if you are thinking about doing console, give yourself plenty of time. Make sure that people who are working on the edition uh, are console players. Play 
competitive games that you're competing with, similar games, and make sure that you're getting user feedback early and on that particular edition of the game. So yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dan. No questions. So, so I might have missed this, but um, as I was scrambling around, but in terms of all of the platforms that you have launched, Cal specifically Calvino Noir on, yeah. what would you determine uh, the most successful? And there could be different terms for successful, but maybe from your perspective. Uh, so it's interesting with Calvin because we're, we're doing another game now, which is very similar proposition, uh, very cons similar consumer proposition. And we're doing it on a similar set of platforms. We've gone slightly larger. We're doing um, iOS, Apple TV, Steam, PlayStation was last time. We're adding Xbox One onto that. Um, and so we're, we're running the same strategy again, even though first time round, initially, iOS sales were very strong. Um, and they've actually continued, the, they've continued. So it has done well on iOS. With Steam, very, very weak release sales. Releasing on Steam is incredibly difficult. Um, they're constantly changing the store. You've got stuff where um, they're, they're making it more algorithm-based. Um, and as they're changing the algorithm, you might just get unlucky. Uh, so, I mean, I'm not blaming it on that, because I think they've done better on the, on the thing. Early on Steam, it was very poor. Later on in, in Steam sales life, anyone who's got a Steam game will know a lot of your sales are on discount, 95%. Um, so your late life sales are absolutely fantastic. Um, and then PlayStation, um, we had an advance on PlayStation, we haven't paid it back yet. So our PlayStation edition wasn't good enough, but we're doing it again. I think um, the important lessons we learned there were to, I guess, uh, look at the shortfalls of our original edition. Our, I think it was the, the actual product just wasn't as strong on console as it was. And we've changed the team around. You know, we've got um, the people who are now doing the, the porting work are not me. They're uh, some uh, very stout console gamers who've put a lot, of, a lot of work and effort into it. We've done a lot earlier. And we're getting feedback. And uh, we're, we're user testing it. So um, oh, we're a lot more kind of confident on that addition. Um, in terms of the strategy, we don't know how it's going to um, perform this time because with iOS, last time it was a launch platform. Uh, this time we're just going to go on the Mac store on launch and we're launching on iOS two months later. And I don't know what that's going to do. You know, we might build the, pro the profile of the game and it might perform better. It might be that we just lose first party marketing opportunities and not do as well. Who knows? Makes sense. Uh, any last questions for Dan? All right, thank you so much. Really appreciate it.